everybody. Hi, just wanted to welcome you to our webinar. Um, so we have two subject matters experts on today's webinar. Um, Will Plummer, he is our chief security officer. As you know, he is the one who leads our EOD secure program. 25 years of U.S. Army um, service. And he has, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, he commanded in multiple special operation units with multiple combat deployments, certified multifunctional logistician, um, supported uh, civil authorities of hundreds of full spectrum EOD incidences and directed the VIP support for the last eight US presidents. We also have uh, Cody Martin on the call as well today. Um, Cody, some of you probably have met. He is the one who leads our SOP team. Um, and so he's the one who would probably help your organization design SOPs for your mail centers. He's a dangerous mail expert because he comes with 12 years experience with the U.S. Postal Inspector. Um, and so he co-created the USPIS IED program for the national headquarters. He was an uh, investigator on high profile and VIP cases. He screened mail for the NFL, NBA president <coughs> and President George W. Bush. And he was the first responder on hundreds of incidences. So his experience is going to be so valuable when we talk about um, you know, some, of our, uh, some of our content today. So thanks again for joining and I will turn it over to, um, to Will. Thank you everybody for coming out today. Um, we're gonna to cover this as a very interesting topic and a lot of what we're gonna hit is generalities or kind of what you could expect, what profile might happen and we're gonna follow it up with some of with some of Cody's background and, and real life experiences for this. So it's gonna be kind of back and forth to the two of us. So it should be hopefully somewhat interesting for everybody involved. Uh, the first thing we're gonna cover is the emotions of human beings. And then we'll talk about profiling, some motivators, examples. Uh, and then at the end, cause you gotta have something to take away. We'll talk about the corporate America threat and how to mitigate some of the, some of the problems that could show up on your front porch. All right, so the first thing we'll talk about is emotions, right? So emotions, drive threat. People generally don't wake up in the morning, have a completely plain day and decide, I'm going to go out right now and make everybody's life miserable by doing something crazy. They don't. They get offended. They get upset. Something happens and that's what causes them to reach out and lash out. They are not a log logical thought process. That reaction is something that comes from whatever is going to boil up and boil out, right? So 80% of your decisions are emotional. And that's not talking about somebody just mailing a threat, but in the reality of everyday life, 80% of what you do is decided by emotions, whether that's I'm having black coffee or I'm going to add mocha cream to it, whatever it's going to be, generally driven by how you feel or what's pushing your, your, uh, your motivation for the day. It is the default decision system for the human body. It's what drives us forward. It's not a bad thing. It's very, very central to our core needs, but Emotions are central. As long as you understand that, when you start looking at how to profile threats as they show up against you, it's extremely useful. Emotions can deviate from logic. In fact, I'd say most times they do. How many times during the day do we stop, look at something sideways and go, how did that person or how did that thing get there? Uh, it just tends to defy logic. When you're looking at threats, it's going to be much the same way. You're going to, something's going to show up and you're going to stop, stand back and go, why? Why'd this, why'd this get here? Well, for somebody, it was an emotional thought that they thought was the right answer for them. Uh, these do not require logic. Emotions can come completely out of left field for what you might consider to be a, a completely out of the ordinary answer for somebody else is ordinary for them and what you'd expect for to show up. And the big thing that comes is why profiling works. So human beings are animals and we tend to react in an emotional way, which is fine. People react and reach out in an emotional way when they feel aggrieved. But with that being said, they also tend to work like a pack herd. People will tend to follow the same trends and will tend to do the same things as the last person or the person that's gonna be following them. So let's go through and do a, a mental exercise real quick, right? You look at your organization, your location, it could be your house, it could be anything. Whatever you're thinking to protect, take off the access badge that you're wearing, walk out the front door, let it lock behind you, turn around and stare at the front of your facility. If you do this mentally, imagine who and how they see your organization. Um, if your companies nowadays all have personalities, uh, companies, if you watch Burger King and Wendy's going at each other on Twitter, they have their own emotions. They have their own reactions. 
So every time Wendy's burns Burger King or whichever one it is, it's, it's public. That's why I use that, that uh, example. The world's going to react. Everybody goes on Facebook or Twitter and shows what Wendy's did to Facebook or what Wendy's did to Burger King. So go outside and imagine the world's looking at your organization. Is it something, have you done something recently that makes somebody angry? Has your organization done something that would highlight them as a target? Or have you slighted somebody in some way, shape, or form? Has somebody just laid off 50, 500, or 5,000 people? All those external influences, if you look from the outside in, you can gain a lot of knowledge on what most likely will be coming your direction. I mentioned this already, but the theory is layoffs, uh, public opinion. And then the other one that hits on a regular basis is, is it ideological? Is there a reason why your organization or facility is an ideological target? That's a non-tangible. That's something that's hard to quantify, but often elicits a very strong emotional response from somebody who would be willing and wishing to do your organization harm. Who's most likely going to be the target? So if you just did a bunch of layoffs, it's probably going to be the CEO and it's probably going to be the HR department. If you just came out and had a brand new opening and you just crushed your competitors on something, uh, you can imagine that it might be something corporate where they're going to try to deface your company and make it look worse to kill stock value. Um, all those kind of coalesce together to give a good threat assessment. If you're still standing outside your organization and staring at the front door, bring it all together and decide what's going to most likely target you. So what's going to hurt you most? If it's a company that doesn't have a very big public profile, if it's something or an organization that if it says something on Twitter, nobody's really noticed, most likely they're not going to worry about public embarrassment. They're going to go for something physical or fiscal where they can send something inside, shutter the doors, cause somebody to have to go outside and end up being decontaminated. That's going to be a target. If it's something that's going to cause a, a visual cue, they're going to want to do something with a line of sight is there where you can act. Well, I'll talk to this one for a line of sight where you could get not only the fire department, the police department, but when you bring in the uh, entertainment industry as well. So all the news channels show up. They want to make sure they have the right facility. So if you stand out front of your of your building and you look at it and you go, there's no way a camera crew can get in here, then maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe that's not how they'll target you. So for profiling, what you got to look for is a couple things. You got to look at the aggrieved mind. And this is a, the example here is Ted Kaczynski. He was famous from the 60s to the 90s about he was the anti-technology um, bomber. But in the aggrieved mind industry, he was also a genius. So Mensa member and worked at Harvard. I mean, a very, very intelligent human being. But he felt aggrieved. So when you're looking at somebody who is going to target your organization or, or is even going to target you, you've got to look at three factors. The most likely, so what's most probably going to happen, the most probable, sorry, most likely, most probable, and the most dangerous. Um, those three combined end up with the most dangerous probability, it's not so high. Most probable, okay, statistically speaking, that's going to happen the most. And most likely is a little bit different. That's what they'll lean to. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the most probable. It's just the one that makes the most amount of sense for the situation. And it might not, they'll parse those two uh, separately is a, little, is a little hard sometimes. But if you have a very, let's say an organization or you tend to lean on, a, on an edge of a fringe of a set of beliefs, those two actually become very important and very independent. And you also have to look at what their desired end state is going to be. Like I mentioned with the organization, is it to get you outside and have all your C-suite exposed to something? Or is it going to be um, something as small as let's get their stock to have a bit of a hit? If it's a corporate uh, event and it's we get, take all the corporate staff outside, good, they, they succeed. That's great. If that corporate event happens and stock doesn't go down and everybody goes past, didn't work. Um, the expected response, you have to think about what they want to get at. I just mentioned that a minute ago. Then you have to think about their constraints and restraints. So Ted Kaczynski, for example, he had no constraints. He could do anything he wanted to. Nobody was stopping him from doing anything. The restraints he had was he couldn't be seen in public. So his constraints were something placed upon him by himself. He was smart enough to get through with all the processes. And the restraints is something that like society would place. So he just want to get caught. He does it in the woods and make sure that nobody sees him putting bombs together. So you have to look at what they can and can't do themselves and what society or the law, for example, is going to stop them from completing. Uh, look at if yourself, if you're ideologically, uh, if you're going to be something that could be seen as a target due to ideological reasons. It's uh, more common than you think 
There are companies out there, for example, through BLM that um, stood out and, and gave money and tried to try to help everybody who was protesting. And then they were themselves targeted because they became an ideological target. It's hard to protest a protest, but it's easier to protest a brick and mortar company that can stand in front of you and have a public release with their own Twitter account. And like I mentioned before, line of sight, uh, think about their brain and how they're, they could possibly target you. If uh, your entire facility is within a fence and then inside that fence, you've got the plastic slats and nobody can see inside. Well, that's probably not gonna try to get you out the front door because they're still not gonna be able to see anything. If they're truly trying to hurt you, then that might be where their outcome is because line of sight then becomes broken. You can go, the police department, everybody's gonna go through that fence. It's not something that you can handle easily. So we're gonna talk about uh, seven motivators today and we're gonna tie incidents to those seven motivators that have happened in the last year. All of these are relevant, all of these are recent and all of these are repeatable. So each one of these topics, I'm not gonna explain them, they're very straightforward, but they represent the core fundamental reaction that a human being will have if they feel aggrieved or if a society or organization feels they've been slighted, okay? Uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about is revenge. So, uh, I'll leave the little blurb from the, the, the uh, news article up. Essentially, Subway started laying off workers early on in the, um, in the uh, pandemic, like quite early on. So they laid off several hundred, then went up to 600. Their headquarters is quite small. It's down here in Connecticut. They've, I've driven by it several times. It's very unassuming. Um, the white powder that showed up uh, was generally aimed at a, react, well, it was revenge for people being laid off, but it was aimed at the headquarters itself. It was a large enough amount of powder that was trying to get the whole facility shut down and inside of the news. So corporate layoffs laid off 600 out of the 1,200 workers that were there. These weren't Subway uh, employees that owned franchises. Uh, their, their business were all franchise owned, franchisees. These were individuals that worked in their headquarters proper. Uh, the reason, again, was revenge. Desired, desired outcome was a shutdown, the evacuation of headquarters. They really wanted to get into the news. They wanted the ability to say something happened here. We don't agree with it. We feel aggrieved. And this is how we're going to handle it. Actual outcome, two news cycles, 48 hours is all that was on the news. Uh, they came in. The, eventually, they were aimed at, it looked like they were trying to go after the CEO and crew when they were there because they were working on odd days. They did screening on a day when most of the staff wasn't there. So minimal impact, no suspect, no charges because nobody was really affluent. Nobody's had anything happen with it. They haven't come back on. Now, through these, we're going to have Cody come in and talk about some of the incidents he's had happen to him. So, Cody, do you have something relevant to this? Yeah, just uh, thinking about it, uh, one of the first uh, bomb cases that I ever worked as a postal inspector was a guy by the name of John Tompkins. He called himself the Bishop Bomber. Uh, not sure where he came up with the name, but that's that was his crowning achievement. But he... Uh, he, did, he mailed, you know, he was really motivated by, by revenge. Uh, basically, he had invested money through several different companies and uh, the stock market was not performing the way that he expected it to. So uh, in his all his wisdom, his plan was to start sending all of these uh, threatening letters to um, owners, employees of a different investment companies that he was working with. He was threatening to like, kill their family, uh, kill the employees, kill their coworkers if they didn't do his bidding. So he was basically trying to get them to manipulate stock prices, which they cannot do. Right. He was wanting them to manipulate stock prices so he could recover some of his losses. Now, the problem with this guy, other than that, he was crazy, is that when these threatening letters didn't work, he started escalating because he, he, he basically felt like he had been messed over by these companies. So he wanted revenge on them. So he ended up putting devices together and mailing them out uh, to, I think he sent one to Chicago area, one of the suburbs up there. Uh, he sent one to Denver and one to Kansas city. So, uh, but again, he wanted revenge. That was his primary motivation. And uh, you know, he ended up getting arrested. We, we figured out who he was, ended up catching him. And he, I think he got 37, 37 years uh, in prison after he represented himself, which probably wasn't the best, best idea for him to do. So, um, but that was the first time I had, you know, it was expressly revenge that kind of drove that whole scenario and escalated it through the process. Thanks, Cody. The other, the other thing too to pay attention to is, uh, as Cody talks, a lot of these are federal charges at the end. It crosses state lines. It goes to the United States Postal Service. It's a federal charge. So that's a, okay. that's a significant difference. There's a big difference between that and state time. All right. So uh, anger, that's another one that drives people. This is a very recent event. So I'm sure everybody caught this one on the news where a French national moved to Canada, got a Canadian citizenship, started mailing uh, rice and filled letters, 
not only to the President of the United States and the White House, but also, for some reason, uh, a bunch of the legislators in Texas. Um, there's a history of been arrested a few times. She'd been arrested for traveling under a legal uh, license, traveling, uh, driving with a, without a license, uh, weapons charges, a few other things. So she's pretty angry. And you've seen her in the news. She lit, excuse me, mailed letters to the White House. Uh, just a general side note, every White House administration has had rice and mail to them since 2003. Uh, George Bush Jr. was the first one. It's happened to everyone since. It's not uncommon. Uh, she does have a history of criminal activity and it didn't necessarily show up as being criminal activity for, for letters. And this just escalated. So when you get angry at something, you can't reach out and touch the target because it's physically separated, i.e. president in the White House, you end up with another way to reach out and touch people. And that's why people choose mail. Uh, desired outcome was legitimately a political statement. She thought that uh, she was doing something that was 100% in her right to do. I don't know how that could ever be seen, but that's what she thought. And none of the thoughts that came out or nothing's happened inside the federal court have been, had any station of reality. It's, it's extremely on the fringe side of just pure raw anger. And then when you get to that point, don't expect any common sense to come when it shows up in front of you. Uh, the actual outcome, we've all seen it. Letters were intercepted, uh, arrested, tried to go back to Canada, be extradited. We're keeping her in U.S. federal courts, and you'll see her in the next probably 12 to 14 months when they when they convict or try or whatever. She's alleged right now. Um, Cody, what do you have on this one? Yeah, the, I, I only, during my career, I only worked one, one uh, Rison case where it was a legitimate biological threat. The rest of them were either hoaxes or uh, such low grade compounds that they didn't really uh, kind of rise to the, to the nature of this one. But there was a, there was a lady that uh, by the name of Shannon, Shannon Richardson, who um, she was an aspiring actress that lived out in East Texas. She, I think she had a couple of B rolls in like uh, the walking dead and a couple of things like that. Um, but she ended up sending some rice and lace letters to uh, president Obama. And then well, then New York Mayor uh, Michael Bloomberg. So she ended up sending a couple of those uh, letters out. Basically, she just took the compound, you know, she used castor beans and lye and kind of did a little homemade job, right, of making making rice and, and uh, mailed those out. And she tried to frame her husband on this deal. She was, her motivation for this was, um, well, she had stated in letters, she was, an, she was angry at some of the anti-Second Amendment type issues that were going on. But the funny thing about it was, she didn't own any guns. She didn't. She didn't possess any any weapons that were affected by any uh, Second Amendment issues. So uh, we don't know if that was just kind of a crazy derangement type thing going on or what. But uh, again, she ended up sending them to those to, those two individuals, and uh, I think she got 18 years federal prison was kind of her her legitimate outcome in that case. But you know, again, she was she was like you said, there's no logic to it whatsoever. The writings were kind of uh, weird ramblings. Uh, she couldn't physically reach these targets. So what did she do? She she used the mail uh, postal system. So it was an easy way for her to, um, to do that. She wasn't smart in the fact that she drafted some of the notes on her phone. She ordered castor beans online. She used credit cards, like all. Oh, it looks like Cody froze. And she got 18 years in prison for sending out those two letters. Okay. Uh, so the next we'll talk about is criminal. This has happened, uh, actually increased number to, this year, a lot of, of anger and aggression has come out this year in, in regards to, to mail that's enemy criminal. Um, the one that, we're, that we have up here real quick we'll talk about is Mayor Mike Duggan and his response to um, militia types discussing actually kidnapping him and sending a mail threat that they were going to snatch him. That was after the Michigan mayor or the Michigan governor had been the plot against her had been foiled. So uh, a few things come up. And, and one of the things that's interesting about this is projecting threats through the mail is criminal. And it's 100 percent. You can you can be held accountable for what you write, just like yelling in somebody's face or, or but that's a little bit harsher. It's perceiving a threat. So the scenario was kidnapping and death threats. Uh, reasons it was covid restrictions. Um, there's a lot of frustration over that. And I can totally understand it. But um, I don't know what the outcome would have been, except snatching a mayor wasn't necessarily going to be a, a smart thing to do. Um, their desired outcome overall was see a reduction in government oversight. So this is fringe. Um, whether you pick left side or right side, people on the on the fringes reaching out and essentially through criminal activity, trying to impose their will on sub on top of other uh, other people, other organizations. Uh, the outcome, security upgrades. Uh, there's a long information hack on Mayor Mike Duggan and what he didn't 
uh, do. Even in this account, he said, yeah, I usually don't drive with security people. I might want to rethink that. But there were arrests and federal responses, but the security was upgraded. Um, for this, effectively, this happens all the time, right? If you, uh, Cody, you had something about this for, for the general anthrax threat, right? Well, yeah, I would just say that this is one of the things that I saw uh, regularly, and it's, it's very easy for someone to uh, just take a letter and leave it, or an envelope, leave it empty, put a stamp and an address on it, and write the word anthrax on the outside of it. And the kind of response that that generates is huge, right? Because people receive it, especially if they're not utilizing any sort of screening technology. If they could see that there's no powder inside, they could reduce that, that response, right? But uh, if they can't, then, you know, here comes the full screening uh, response from law enforcement. Typically that um, if they didn't have SOPs in place, right, they ended up calling 911 immediately and getting a full hazmat response. And, you know, there's evacuations and containment and all this kind of thing. But, you know, it's easy to do. It's inspired by, you know, even if you go back to 2001 and look at the original uh, anthrax case, um, there was articulated threats with a lot of this stuff. And even what, what I want to emphasize on this is if, if you're receiving kind of crazy or deranged or eccentric type mail, you need to be keeping a record of it because a lot of times, just like with the Don, John Tompkins case, if they do not get the response that they want just through these written communications, yeah. they're going to escalate through that threat cycle. And I've seen it time and time again. So keeping record of that, even if you're dealing with it internally and just discarding it, you want to keep records of that, you know, photocopies or pictures of uh, the contents in case it does escalate. There needs to be something there that uh, investigators can use to backtrack on. But uh, don't dismiss those in their entirety and, and just think in your mind, you know, if you were to receive something like that, what kind of impact would just those words on the exterior of an envelope, you know, have on your organization? Yeah, and it goes back to profiling, right? If, you, if you're uh, somebody who's in, imposing COVID restrictions on your city or your state or your country, there's going to be a reaction. You can expect it. And then you have to profile where you think that that reaction is going to come from just so you have some sort of plan in place. All right. So, um, Pat, we'll talk about this one real quick. This one was early on in the year. Uh, this was a church that was not shutting down due to COVID. Uh, the, the mandate was not uh, out yet. You didn't have to shut down, but companies were. And this church decided it was more um, important for the people that use their facility that they held actual in-person church. This is early on, right? Um, that organization or that church at that point became a target, obviously. And the suspect package that showed up was a hoax IED. Um, the reason, again, was in-person churches, church services. And the desired outcome was, was to shame them. So people were upset about the church not adhering to what the state of California was putting out regarding their COVID restrictions, saying you need to stop showing up here. So if you're working the church security, which there's a lot of church security stuff going on now, you should be standing up for that church going, where's this target going to show up? Where's the threat going to be? Probably at our front doors. It's probably going to be somewhere public, which is where this one ended up, right in the front of the big doors. So you could see that when uh, the package hit, first responders hit, that there was a picture of the church's name in the backdrop when the news agency showed up. That was the goal. And they think your goal is successful, 100%. They, the state mandate shutdown was coming anyway. Uh, there were federal charges that were brought, but that church didn't meet in purpose in uh, person anymore. Regardless of the payment that the individual who sent the threat was willing to pay, they accepted it. And so I, I got what I wanted. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about another one of these real quick. So this year, uh, this goes along with also prejudice and hate. So the NAACP in Baltimore office received several racist letters that showed up and, uh, one thing that you can look at when things are passionate like this is when they, people want to get a reaction. So the NAACP in Baltimore, the main office, when that one was hit, it was racial epithets on the outside of a letter. Well, it wasn't just the, the manifesto they had inside of it. They wrote on the outside of it as well. It was very common in uh, President Barack Obama's uh, uh, presidency as well. The letters that were threatening, they had stuff on the outside of it. It was clearly, clearly uh, a they felt important about writing that down. Um, what that caused is the NAACP office in Baltimore to take the screening area, essentially push it up to the front door and everybody else that worked was in the back. They didn't have the ability to make any changes to their facility because they had no extra money to apply or move out. 
but they changed what they did to make sure that those threats never got farther than four feet from the front door. And we'll talk about those at the end. There's ways to deal with it. But they saw it coming. They identified that they were a target and they reacted to it. And in response, one person ended up opening mean letters or if it would have been a threat, one person would have been exposed and not the entire office. And so this one's kind of funny. We can't be serious about everything. Um, this, it, this is interesting. It happens every day if you work in the prisons. I'll just pull this one up because we'll talk about it. Um, prisons are constantly in, basically just call it war, with the outside versus the inside. Trying to keep everybody who wants to get something because they're kept from having anything, uh, from getting it. That's part of the reason about being in prison. So this is an interesting thing. After the opening the can, the officer reported to play a chemical smell and finding 3.9 pounds of synthetic marijuana. I don't know what the, how they would hide 3.9 pounds of synthetic marijuana in a jail, but that's that was it. There were several other things that came with this one, but um, we put this one out for a couple of reasons. Don't expect everybody to be the smartest, right? So this one was put in as being... Uh, I believe it was uh, collard greens. Yeah, it was collard greens. With this was also a bunch of Swedish fish, uh, the candy. If you ever seen those, they're just red and gummy. But somebody taken out the red Swedish fish and put in multicolored edible gummy marijuana or uh, pot gummies, edibles. So everybody knows Swedish fish are only red. The guards and the screeners know it's only red. So that's what initiated this whole event. Um, this is a generic one that happens all the time. So drugs are always going in or out. Um, essentially just acknowledge that inmates are going to lose privileges and uh, the sender, they're most likely to get arrested. It, it's very, very common. Um, Cody, do you have anything interesting on this one or just kind of let it roll to the next one? No, we'll, we'll move on. Okay. So prejudice, uh, back to serious, I guess. Um, this is coming up more and more. I mentioned it with the, with the NAACP in Baltimore. This was a Japanese cookware store in Torrance. Uh, the individual was raised in Japan lived in the United States for, for most of um, the last 10 years. And essentially they were given bomb threats just because of who they were, who they, who they stood for. Um, one thing that's come out of, if you want to profile, look at emotions, a lot of people who weren't necessarily open to put their feelings and what they truly thought about others out in the public space during this pandemic have decided that that's a great time to do it. They've uh, really stepped up and, and things like this have happened more and more often. And it's not necessarily that, that I guess they're happening more often. They're just more highlighted. The, the effects are more overt. So these are hate crimes and uh, usually brought out a personal prejudice to ignorance. Desired outcome was intimidation and it did intimidate the individual that it was sent to. And however, investigations, charges, and fines followed. One thing that's true about most of these mailborne threats is individuals that relay them automatically start some way for them to be caught. I mean, Cody wouldn't have had a job working for the dangerous mail program and the USPS if there wasn't a way to track them down from the beginning to the end, it might take a minute. Uh, but in today's society, it's happening a lot faster than it used to be. I mean, it's pretty quick. You can stop a bunch of threats. Cody, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I'll just say the, the, um, when I was up in Illinois, I, I was, uh, my, one of my first couple of field offices was up in Rockford and, um, I was, working on the tail end of an investigation that was involving a couple of twin, there were two twin brothers that um, had sent a uh, bomb. They basically built a bomb. They had disguised it in the cardboard box and had sent it to the city of Scottsdale, Arizona, where they had hired an individual for a position in the, um, I think it was called the diversity and dialogue a department of the city. Anyways, they were targeting this guy because of his race. And, you know, when you're talking about, profiling, looking at uh, people's backgrounds, the stuff that they're putting out in the public eye. Uh, these guys had been monitored for years for their involvement in white supremacist activity, right? So it wasn't anything new. They weren't hiding their beliefs. Uh, they had made uh, threats over the years, you know, just kind of alluding to, you know, committing acts of violence. They were very outspoken. They didn't hide it at all. So, you know, they had been monitored um, and it, that kind of fell to the wayside, right? There's so many of those types of things going on. And it's so easy to say things out in the public air nowadays that it's impossible for law enforcement to track everyone, right? So that's why a lot of times when I'm talking to organizations, I'm like, you know, unfortunately, some of this burden falls on you within the organization to keep track of these eccentric type of people who are making contact uh, with your organization, just with the crazy stuff, right? So 
Um, these guys milled, uh, these brothers milled this guy a bomb. He opened it up. It exploded, right? It was a functioning device. It injured uh, two people within the office. And, you know, investigation proceeded at that point. And, and like you said, it took quite a while. There's a lot more resources nowadays and things that we can use to kind of expedite those things. But, you know, it took quite a while. Uh, the main, the main culprit, the one brother ended up getting 40 years, you know, in federal prison, but, uh, in his mind, the, the end justified the means and, and he felt like it was worth the risk. So, um, but again, like they had been on the radar, their prejudice was known, uh, by different entities and, you know, it was something that, um, could have been tracked a little bit better, you know, but a lot of, a lot of times just interagency communication is not the best sharing of information has been improved greatly, but, um, again, total prejudice and racially motivated in that regard. Absolutely. All right. So we got to end on a little bit of, a little bit of interesting here. So, uh, stupidity is hard to plan against, right? So the example we have here is a group of individuals who mailed a large amount of cocaine to an FBI field office. Um, it would, had the office address on it. They just simply put down the wrong location motivation, who knows, but, uh, one thing you can't ever plan for is, well, 100% plan against is stupidity and then things that are just nonsensical. Um, there's no good reason for it. Uh, just acknowledge the fact that the human being is a fallible animal and that it happens all the time. So a lot of these events that you see that you, you like I said earlier, you kind of cock your head sideways and look at, they could be extremely motivated, but also don't, don't underscore the fact that people don't necessarily always... Uh, get the outcome they're looking for. And sometimes it's, it's quite comical to watch it happen. So the next thing we're talking about is corporate threat, right? So what the expectations are of, of threats against corporate America and then how corporate America can essentially protect itself. And we'll talk about two sides of that, one for the building and one for the people, one for the individuals involved, right? So your expectations of the threats, they're gonna go down uh, from nothing that we have to worry about all the way down to bad here, just so we kind of run them from, you know, mildly annoying to this is a really, really bad day. In other words, make, it a, false, make a mistake or a false positive, that happens 95% of the time. It's almost always a mistake. Somebody looked at something and thought they saw something and they didn't, or a false positive, a piece of equipment just gave you the wrong outcome for when you gave it a test. Um, the next thing we're seeing a lot of increases is illicit materials. So that's not necessarily something illegal. It might be something that's not authorized in your organization or on your, in your footprint. Uh, we use wish.com. Here's an example. If you ever go to that website, uh, they just now took off silencers. So up until about two months ago, you could order a silencer. They were labeled as oil, oil separators, and they came in amazingly accurate sizes of nine millimeter, uh, 3.57. All the general bullet diameters is what they came in. So illicit materials, something to look out for. Uh, the next one is hazard materials. Uh, this is not necessarily something bad, but usually something to pay attention to for uh, a mistake. So things start smoking. It could be hazardous material incident that might not have malice behind it. It could just be an accident, but they do happen on a regular basis. Uh, white powder threats, those are getting more common because you get such a reaction. Uh, you do have to expect that that's going to be, if you have to plan for worst case, which is what we talked about, worst case is anthrax. Worst case is ricin. That means you're going to get a full-blown reaction every time unless you can mitigate it in some other form or fashion. Drugs are on the rise. Uh, I had a conversation with the CSO from a Fortune 50 company who said that was his biggest threat. It was drugs in and out of his headquarters because of the way their company looks and what they represent. That was his number one. So, and because people are working from the house now, yes, but also means drug dealers aren't on the street corners. So a lot of illicit material drugs are end up being sent to the office instead of the house. So it's up and coming. Hoaxes. Um, hoaxes are up there and dangerous because they're meant to look real. So you'll get all the way down to a full-blown response. Uh, you'll get somebody like myself showing up, you know, an EOD person with background of blowing things up, and they're going to show up and get all the way to the point of doing it before they stop. Well, that was a successful attack because everything that happened is exactly what they wanted to have happen. And then the worst case follow-on is it a legitimate IED or improvised, improvised uh, incendiary device or something along that sort. Uh, in the last 45 days, there's been two of them. Two IEDs have gone off. One went off in California inside of a post office, and you don't hear much about it, but it detonated. And the other one went off inside of a house uh, outside of Maryland, or in Maryland. It was uh, the last mile style threat. Individual had the package put on the front porch. Grandma picked it up, put it on the kitchen table, and it spent all day long before he came home at night, picked, took it into his room, opened it up, and ended up detonating in his lap. All right, so 
Now we'll talk about the, so that's the general threats that we're discussing and you have to pay attention to when you're, when you're um, worried about profiling yourself. But common sense mitigation techniques is things that you can do now. Things that you can do essentially right away without having to worry about talking to facilities or making any crazy changes because most facilities that we talk to, go in, deal with, they're all four scenarios. We would all love for everybody to say, all 50 of you people are gonna work in this building. Individual one through 50, what are your needs? And have everybody's needs met. But that's that's not the way the real world works. 99% um, of the time you're moving in on a facility that's already built, uh, you get told, hey, mailroom's in that corner or it's in that closet or it's in that basement. And that's just what you get forced to deal with. Um, and I'll, I'll open these up so we can discuss them if there's anything. Uh, reception, that's that's important. Where are you going to stop something at? Uh, that's not necessarily uh, what's set for you. So like I said before with the NAACP, they move that desk closer to the front door to provide security for anybody standing in the rear. So that means all deliveries were dropped, put down, and, every, and the and delivery person left. So everything you could do to make changes to the reception area, that's, that's great. Drop tables, boxes, things that you could put stuff off to a corner. Uh, if you're working like sorting areas, think exposure, not just for yourself, for the facility and for others. So if you're gonna do sorting and it's, you've all of a sudden profiled yourself and you are somebody that's going to be a high profile threat, we might wanna move that from the front office to somewhere earlier on, like catch at the loading dock. Let's not do this inside if we think that we've now become a higher threat. Um, screening is the same way, move that off to another location. And then if you can, for the facility, think about things that if you find a threat, what are you going to do with it? If you just drop it in the middle of the reception area, that, that's okay. But there's a, other ways that you could handle it, whether that's finding a corner that's going to be more sturdy than others or behind a pillar that's got uh, a window that vents to the outside where you would be able to vent if something detonated. So explosives would go or pressure would go out the window and not around the building. Um, pay attention to ingress and egress routes. So if you're going to have to dial 911 because something bad happened and you drop that package right there at reception, now everybody's have to walk past it to leave. And then think about the other way. If you were all the way to the back of the facility where there's no doors and you do call for first responders, now they have to go through the entire facility to get to the threat. So try to think of some ways to be good for both where you minimize exposure, but you maximize the ability for a first responder to actually solve the problem. Um, Cody, what have you seen on this throughout your history of uh, dealing with organization no i would say that's i would say that's those are very good points you know it's a my my what i've seen in my recommendation is you want to engage in the uh the visual and tactile process as early on as you can like you mentioned earlier if you can start engaging these things at a loading dock you know that's ideal to keep the threats outside especially for things that are obvious in nature and like you said, 99.9% .9 of individuals are, you have to work with what you're given, right? There's no, uh, very few folks are, have the ability to, or to build a, you know, a, an isolated uh, mail room from the ground up with an unlimited budget for screening equipment and all this kind of stuff. So you're working with what you have, but, you know, considering things as trends emerge, you know, and we, we harp on uh, war shipping a lot because it's something that's new, right? So whereas before we didn't really consider our transit route, if we're, if we're taking mail from the loading dock to our screening room, we might not have thought about uh, walking next to our, uh, our servers or any other yeah. uh, sensitive infrastructure. Now that is something that, you know, depending on your organization, you have to consider. So you may have to change up your transfer routes just to avoid exposing um, those types of things, you know, so just thinking about all the little details uh, can make a big difference. And, you know, there's, there's usually a solution that we can come up with, uh, using what you have, it may not be the the perfect solution uh, in all senses, but it's going to be it's going to be something that probably fits your needs. So, um, you know, it's those little details that add up and trying to mitigate these threats. Yeah, hundred percent. All right. So, uh, one thing that we, I I really like to talk this every time because if you've never been involved in an emergency response scenario or you've never been um, the individual when your pulse goes up and your adrenaline start kicking off. There's a few things that you have to worry about individually when you talked about people. So organizations, we could talk about desks and moving things and, re and routes and what we're going to do for the physical location. But the second side of that is people have to react in that environment. And people, when something happens, do react funny. They tend to just step on and do something you never expect them to do. Uh, the first thing we're talking about people, especially in an environment like this, is communication is key, right? Talking from the beginning is important. Keeping everybody up on what's going on, why you're doing something and explaining what the next set of steps should be. 
Uh, if you ever work around a, uh, an incident site where you have a bunch of first responders standing around, there are rings of information that go fire department saying one group of things, but they're all saying it to each other. Police department saying another thing, all to each other. Everybody's talking. And then somebody in the middle is grabbing the fire department, the police department, and all the other entities, and kind of coalescing that information. In the same scenario, if it's 10 people in an office, somebody's going to have to take that role up as well. Uh, there's two different things. If somebody's exposed, uh, evacuation versus isolation. So evacuation is getting everybody out in the parking lot. That is, we just had a bad event. Something happened. Let's get everybody away from it. Isolation is you're the individual who just opened that package and now you have white powder all over your lap. You are going to be isolated from everybody else. So those are two key factors that hopefully your screening people understand because if somebody is exposed and you do an evacuation, you don't want the individual that is exposed to run into the middle of all the people who are not. So that's something you have to plan for and against. Uh, I quarantine, it, days of COVID somewhat is, uh, is a bit of a joke on that, but it's, um, that's essentially what the isolation person is going into. Until the fire department, whatever runs your hazmat team can step in and do a decontamination, you're, it's just gonna have to happen. They're gonna need to acknowledge that they're gonna be quarantined for a little bit. Then the decontamination will happen. And the big thing on this is contamination control. So. If you are the individual that gets hit with white powder and you are the individual that's covered and standing in a quarantine that's isolated from everybody else, don't go walking around doing anything crazy. Just sit down, have a seat, listen to first responders. They'll tell you what to do. Um, if there's nobody there except for the people that you, that you happen to work with, somebody be responsible and talk to them. You don't have to go sit next to them and hug them, but talk to them. Uh, this is the second to last slide. Cody, you got anything on this one? I would just say uh, real quick on people acting funny, you know, from what I've seen throughout my career is that the longer these incidents drag on, the, the funnier people act. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I just know the w one thing that comes to mind is uh, I, I went out on a call early on in my career and um, it was in downtown Chicago and I was trying to drive in through a snowstorm and long story short, it took me a while to get there and there was tons of other first responders and et cetera there. Uh, what had happened though, psychologically, this scene wasn't getting cleared fast enough. So employees who had potential exposure to this white powder, right, their minds started playing with them. So uh, six employees who ultimately were exposed to rock salt because it's winter in Chicago and salt is everywhere. Um, you know, four out of the six ended up going to the hospital for yeah. all these symptoms, right? They were, but a lot of it was, their, they, they, it was messing with their mind so much that, um, Either their body was physically reacting to it, they were dreaming up things, whatever the case may be. But a lot of it was due to the incident dragging on so long. And okay. so the key is to uh, have things in place where you can take care of these as fast as possible, right? You can't predict weather. You, that has a uh, bearing on things. But uh, communicating with your folks, letting them know can hopefully alleviate that to where we're not having medical transport and all kinds of crazy scenarios going on. So uh, just keep that in mind as well. Right. That's the, People are funny. All right. So... Just to roll this up, we have uh, three little central ideas that, that we that talk about it. Think about, think like the aggressor. And then with that being sued, continually profile yourself. Walk outside mentally. Whenever you think that your corporation, company, organization has changed their stance or done something that might affect somebody and take a look. If there's something that you think somebody might find uh, a reason to target you, that's it's a good reason to do a mental, uh, a mental game and try to figure out what, uh, what you can do with that. Uh, the second was keep up to date on what your company stands for and high profile employees, new CFO, new CEO, uh, the board does something. Those events all can have far reaching um, effects. Those aren't things that are necessarily evil. It's just the way somebody might perceive them to be. I mean, who would have thought, you know, increased transportation, cut the cost of your plane ticket from exorbitant cost down to next to nothing. Ted Kaczynski. He really did. And nobody really thought that was something that would be a thing, but somebody found a reason to be aggrieved with it. And then the last one is pay attention to trends. Many will replicate and uh, many will repeat in different areas. So um, I look at trends and threats all the time and I try to put them out so people can see them on LinkedIn, all of my professional uh, people that I work with. And those trends tend to wander. So it's something to really, really just not focus on every day, like you see something that's going to hit there, but keep in the front of your mind and make sure you put it into your thought process and that you apply that thought process when you're doing your uh, profile against yourself. So that's about uh, what we've got for slides. Are there any questions? If Nancy pile it back up on here in a second. Hi, I'm right here. <laughs> um, 
So we do have one that's in okay. um, an open forum. Um, and thanks you guys, that, that, was, that was really awesome. So the question goes, a lot of people are upset with the elections. Anything yeah. happened during the general election this year? Did anything happen to the general election? Mm -hmm. uh, Cody, I, I've got two, I don't, but- I don't, Yeah, I don't recall. There wasn't, there wasn't as much as we were anticipating. Yeah. It was kind of a, everybody ramped up for it. And I think there was just other things that people were doing in lieu of utilizing the mail, but you said you had a couple, Will, that- Well, no, I was, was going to, examples were, so one of the reasons I think why the number was, two, two reasons what I was talking about, why we haven't seen anything, was this was the most watched election. And- those mail-in ballots were the most watched pieces of papers for, I mean, I would say in the recent history, right? Um, I mean, I remember the, the hanging chads between Bush and Gore in 2000, and that was ended up being a joke after a year. There was a lot of security in place, and whatever got found wasn't going to get it publicized, I don't think. Um, I didn't see anything that happened. Yeah, I know the inspection service uh, within that organization alone, they ramped up and uh, had a lot of folks specifically dedicated to threats related to the election, mail-in ballots and polling places and all kinds of things like that. So um, the efforts were there to kind of prevent a lot of that from occurring in the first place. So my, that might have contributed to the lower uh, numbers. Yeah, and as high profile as it was, if it would have happened, I'm pretty sure we'd have all seen, heard about it. Or somebody in security was really good at keeping that one squashed. Any other ones come in to answer? Um, just wanted to wait to see if there's any open form because I do have one on my um, on my email here. Um, after completing the mail security training, I realized that the mail volume and, and variety would help increase my screening uh, competence. What suggestions do you have for, oh, where I put my glasses on, <laughs> for a facility that's not receiving much either? Um, are there any contentious educa continuing education uh, modules or websites to help increase my screening skills. Ah, well. uh, Cody, that's you again. <laughs> yeah, um, no. So for low volume, so I'm, I'm assuming in that scenario, you're just not getting a lot of stuff coming through. So you're not getting the reps in to uh, kind of build up that, uh, that experience. I would say, um, you know, doing some dedicated training internally, you know, making up just mock letters, you know, uh, if you want to throw things in there to, um, um, to practice on for your folks. Um, there are, you know, the LMS platform through Race Secure has training that you could go through as well for uh, kind of a continuing education type thing uh, that does address some of that, you know, advanced screening type operation. And, and Nancy probably has more info, information on that, but a lot of it's going to be in-house. Uh, there's not a whole lot out there, to be honest with you, because a lot of that stuff is not necessarily thrown out to the public eye, right? We don't want the yeah. bad guys seeing what we're doing. So, uh, it, you have a hard time accessing it publicly, but um, there are some things you could do internally as well as through organizations like like Race Secure. Um, well, if I could yeah. if if I could add, um, a lot of times when we do finish the training, and that those are excellent points, or Cody, and yes, we do have additional training. Um, you could definitely reach out to me, and I could guide you to those. But I think the key, and I think everybody that I had the, the pleasure of training would say is. Um, I would just scan as much stuff as you can, even if they're not dedicated letters um, that you, were you would traditionally scan just to get used to using the system. Um, it's just scan whatever does come in, even if they're no vendors. It's just for you to stay on top of and keeping you, you know, very um, alert um, is something that I highly suggest, especially when you're starting to use the system. Um, as, for, uh, as for the actual training, if you want to reach out, we could guide you as to where to go. Um, then again, if, uh, you know, for every Everybody on, on board, it's so very important, such a great question that um, you continue to, um, you know, maybe on a quarterly, quarterly or at least twice a year to have the entire team come together. And this is something we'll be reaching out to do is recertification as well with regard to how to use the system and on you know, upcoming threats and using the systems in different ways and stuff like that. So those are all things that we'll be reaching out to do uh, with the current team as well. So we can definitely help you with that. Yep. And then there's a lot of training aids you can buy. There's uh, companies that make them. You can um, easily Google search them. I don't, I don't, I think we need to throw companies' names out, but like I'll give you one DSA detection. That's a good one. They got a lot of things that you can pick up for your organization. And then honestly, just like the TSA does their screening. So the TSA every hour, they've, they've gamified their, their screening. Now they also have a 95% failure rate when they're externally checked. So it's not necessarily the best way of doing it, but uh, if you get a, a, a set of, and we send you the, the stuff when we, we send out units, but 
um, just run one through and don't let your screeners know. Put it in the pile. And let it, if it's gamified a little bit, the people who are doing the screening know that they're looking for something. And then with that, I'm not saying reward it, but it's something that you want to pay attention to. If somebody's out there actually paying enough attention to catch everything that gets put in front of them, give them credit for it. Do something about it. So, Yeah, the only thing I will add one more thing on that. Uh, in, in addition to just suspect mail and packages and stuff, you know, uh, like Nancy was saying, have them run as much of the normal yeah. type mail that you get as possible yeah. because when you have low volume, you're not getting the reps in to recognize what is normal for your organization. So the more that you can look at that would be, even if you're running kind of the same stuff through, maybe orienting it differently, uh, switch, switching things around just to get an idea, okay, this is what normal looks like. The abnormal stuff is going to stick out that much easier. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for that. That's a really good question. Um, I do have one more that came through the email and it said, um, I had just finished doing uh, the SOP via Race Secure's help. How many times a year should we be reviewing our SOPs given the new possible threats? Uh, yeah, you want me to... I, I got one answer real quick before you jump on that one, Cody, because I know. Go for it. So that is situation dependent from the way I see it. You need to pay attention to what status quo looks like for you. And when it changes, reassess. If you have a change in people, if you have a change in anything that's significant, reassess it. That's just the generic on everything. So whether that's profiling, looking at what your probable threats are, your, your paths that people could get threats into you, any of those things, when something different changes, look at it all. Sorry, Cody. No, you're absolutely right. And that, you know, that comes down to just general physical security assessments as a whole, yep. like your entire security posture. But um, people look for numbers, right? 12 months. I don't know that once a year, that's completely arbitrary because there's so many factors that go in on influencing that. You know, anytime there's a new threat that's emerging, anytime you hear something that's new, um, you need to look at your, your mail screening uh, procedures and, and, and think to yourself, right? Does this address the things that are going on right now? Um, and that's kind of where I, how I gauge it, you know, with it, with a rapidly evolving environment that could be four times a year, right? It could be a bad year. Um, you could go a year and things may not change. You do a quick assessment, things are good. You know, you move forward, but it's so situational, like Will said, but, uh, you know, staying on top of emerging trends, threats that are going on around the world, and then just looking at your company as a whole, how it's public postures change, things going on in the media, like all of those things that you normally look at for your regular security assessments, uh, all that goes into play. Yep. Well said, Cody. Um, that's, um, that's all I have at my end. Okay. And I think we've been able to answer the questions. Anything else um, before we wish you a wonderful day and sign off? No, thank you very well, much, I, everybody, for coming. Yeah, I think that last slide had everybody's contact information. Please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you very yep. much. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Nice seeing you. Bye-bye.